Hello, friends. Welcome to the National Constitution Center and to our final convening of the year of America's Town Hall. And happy Bill of Rights Day. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president and CEO of this wonderful institution. Before we begin, let's inspire ourselves, as always, for the conversation and learning ahead by reciting together the National Constitution Center's mission statement. Here we go. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the US Constitution among the American people on a nonpartisan basis. Friends, as you know, we are a nonprofit and we rely on your generous support to uh, fulfill our mission and to make possible programs like these. I'm thrilled that we've launched a crowdsourcing campaign to support these programs. Thanks to our friends at the John Templeton Foundation, every dollar you give toward our We the People podcast, which also supports the podcasting of America's Town Hall, uh, will be matched with a one-to-one -one match up to a total of $234,000 to celebrate the exciting 234th anniversary of the ratification of the Constitution. We've got a great response so far with donations from 24 states, and we're aiming from, for all 50 the first uh, states in the alphabet, including Alabama and Arkansas, are not yet represented. So if you're from an A state, please consider uh, giving $5, $10. Just signal your support in this great community of lifelong learners. And you can do that at constitutioncenter.org slash we the people. Uh, we'll also put a link in the chat box. We'll take your questions throughout the program. So put them in the Q&A box throughout the show. And now it's so uh, such an honor to introduce our Panel, and I'm so looking forward to learning from each of our scholars. William Allen is Emeritus Dean at James Madison College and Emeritus Professor of Political Philosophy at Michigan State University. He has served as Chair of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, is the author of many pathbreaking books, uh, which have taught us so much about our founding ideals, including most recently George Washington, America's First Progressive, the Personal and Political Three Fables by Montesquieu, and, and so many other wonderful works. Erica Bakioki is fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center and a senior fellow at the Abigail Adams Institute, where she founded and directs the Walton Craft Project, so appropriate for our topic today. Her new book is The Rights of Women, Reclaiming a Lost Vision. She's also the author of many uh, important articles, including Embodied Equality, Debunking Equality, Protection Arguments, uh, for abortion rights, uh, and many others. And Ellen Carroll Du Bois is a distinguished research professor of history at the University of California, Los Angeles. She's the author of many books on the history of women's and suffrage in the U.S., including her most recent book, Suffrage, Women's Long Battle for the Vote. She's the co-author of the leading textbook in U.S. women's history, Through Women's Eyes, an American History with Documents. And Jack Rakoff is William Robertson Co, Professor of History and American Studies and Professor of Political Science uh, where, uh, at Stanford, uh, where he's taught since 1980. He is the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning book, Original Meanings, Politics and Ideas in the Making of the Constitution. Uh, he's also the author of Revolutionaries, A New History of the Invention of America, and his most recent book, Beyond Belief, Beyond Conscience, the radical significance of the free exercise of religion. Thank you so much for joining us, William Allen, Erica Bakioki, Ellen Du Bois, and Jack Rakoff. I'm so excited about our learning today. Our topic is the meaning of equality in America. Of course, we're going to begin with the Declaration of Independence and its famous uh, uh, words. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Uh, William Allen, you uh, have written so powerfully about the intellectual sources of that sentence in the natural law theory, both of classical thinkers like Aristotle and Cicero and enlightenment thinkers uh, like John Locke and Montesquieu and, and Burlamaki, all channeled through the figure of James Wilson, uh, a crucially important but, but less recognized American founder who wrote a kind of uh, uh, essay on the limits of legislative authority in Britain that, that Jefferson had by his side when he wrote the declaration. Tell us about Wilson, how he understood uh, equality and natural law theory and how he relied on the classical and enlightenment sources. I'll certainly uh, address Wilson 
and along the way, if you'll permit me, also try to show his relationship to especially those moments in the committee that drafted the Declaration of Independence, because they are interrelated. But Wilson was, of course, not there for the drafting of the Declaration of Independence. He was a subsequent participant, uh, importantly at the Constitutional Convention of 1787. And we derive our fullest understanding from his discipline statements in his law lectures subsequently published, in which he explains in detail what he means and directs himself to the question of equality. And for Wilson, that question is enfolded within the broader question of the foundations of the government. But Wilson recognized one thing above all else, that is not merely the question of being equal, but upon what foundation equality stands. For Wilson, as all the founders knew, that those who are enslaved under despotism are all equal. And therefore there are different kinds of equality. So the question is what kind of equality is at stake in the founding? And that equality is what Wilson identified as the equal and impartial administration of the laws in a context in which all are subject to the laws, including the lawmakers. And that is the important distinction. So the way we get to that point through the Declaration of Independence and its predecessor theories is to recognize that the foundation of political life itself is rooted in an understanding of humanity, not an understanding of any legalistic or uh, procedural requirements of political relationship, but of humanity itself. Aristotle is plain in his work for politics and the underlying foundations are present in his work on the ethics that the political community consists of the equal participation of equals. And therefore, only those who can properly be described as members of the community can be called citizens. And no one who's called a citizen can be excluded from the authority of governing the community. That is because that authority is built on the spine of self-government. It requires, therefore, the fundamental recognition of the priority of self-government as a moral principle, which is why the ethics are important, that we discover the equality which is referenced in the Declaration of Independence. When it says all men are created equal, it literally means all human beings have the right of self-government and are not legitimately subjected to the authority of anyone else without their consent. Equality must be paired with the notion of consent in order to be an effective operational principle of social and political relationship, independently of that it has no meaning. There are other meanings of equality. We can talk about income inequalities or equalities and social inequalities and inequalities and all kinds of other things. But the one that is critical in the founding context is that moral principle that no one is born by nature to be the ruler of another. Rule is legitimate which is to say lawful in the higher law sense, not in the positive law sense, only when it is affected by the consent of the ruled individual. So that we must understand government to be self-imposed. When it's imposed in any other relationship, it is illegitimate. That is the classical tradition. That is what the moderns inherited. That is what the moderns developed. What the moderns added to it which gives so much color to our contemporary conversations is the radical insight that this is true for everybody, not just for a favored few. It broke through the age old distinction between those who were capable and those who were not capable. And while they were not foolish and they recognized that there were accidents of nature in which some were born incompetent for reasons of genetic defect or otherwise, it didn't accept that there were any who were not subject to such accidents who were not capable of self-government. Hence, it affirmed the moral capacity of every human being in principle to the right of self-government, the exercise of self-government, and therefore the requirement of consent. That is the fundamental equality. I'll say one more word about this to go back to Wilson. We like to, and often here today, people speak of equality before the law. As I said at the outset, that's not the point. Well, before the law would make us equal under that despotism in which all are slaves. That's before the law. We have to be not as subjects of the law equal, but as authorizers of the law equal, before in another sense, i.e. our equality comes before the law. It is not because we stand as equals in front of the bench, but because we stand as equals in creating the bench that we enjoy equality.
Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction to uh, natural law theory in the classical and founding period. Erica Bakayoki, uh, you uh, are director of the Walton Craft Project and have written powerfully that Mary Walton Craft embraced the classical theory of eudaimonia that Bill Allen just described, the need for self-mastery of our uh, passions and unreasonable emotions to achieve virtue and self-government, both, both in the moral and the political sense. And you're also now a senior fellow at the Abigail Adams Institute. And of course, Abigail Adams famously asked her husband, John, to remember the ladies in, in, in founding a government and drafting laws. Tell us about Mary Woltencraft's uh, vision of uh, equality and how it may have related to that of Abigail Adams. Yes, thank you. It's a real honor to be with all of you today. Um, I think a really helpful actually place to start in thinking about Mary Wollstonecraft's understanding of equality and that of Abigail Adams is actually with someone who influenced both of them quite um, substantially, and that is uh, the Unitarian minister, Richard Price. Um, and it's fascinating to learn um, in the history that when um, the Adams, Abigail and John Adams, um, went, uh, you know, as John was going to serve as the first U.S. ambassador in the court of St. James in 1785, he and Abigail actually join uh, Richard Price's congregation in Newington Green, and Mary Wollstonecraft is actually there as a congregant too. Um, and so, fascinatingly, I mean, Richard Price is this kind of stalwart supporter of the American Revolution. He is a pamphleteer. Um, he, in a, in a pamphlet in 1784, writes, quote, next to the introduction of Christianity among mankind, the American Revolution may prove the most important step in the progressive course of human improvement. But the thing about Richard Price in his correspondence with many of the founders, he was friends with Ben Franklin, he, of course, then knew Adams, he wrote with Jefferson and Washington, is that he actually um, decries when he sees the sort of foundational documents at the founding, he decries basically um, the perpetuation of the slave trade. Um, he actually, uh, you know, which he calls, of course, cruel, wicked, and diabolical. And he's very upset that what he sees is this great opportunity for freedom, um, which he sees as, um, you know, as as Bill was talking about, um, the need for freedom in order to. Uh, you know, um, uh, move towards self-government in oneself. We need self-government in order to have sort of self-mastery of oneself um, that he says, um, I want to just quote him again, because it's really uh, a great, it'll appear that the American people have struggled so bravely against being enslaved themselves are ready enough to enslave others. The event which has raised my hopes of seeing a better state of human affairs will prove only an introduction to a new scene of tyranny and human debasement. The friends of liberty and virtue in America, in Europe will be sadly disappointed and mortified. So he's of course talking about the slave trade, but he's also very upset about the treatment of women in the original um, in the original documents. And so Mary Wollstonecraft of course is listening and so is Abigail Adams. Um, and so, you know, I'll make the one point about each. Wollstonecraft in her Vindication of the Rights of Woman, um, it's a very misunderstood treaty. She's often sort of thought as just sort of lumped together uh, with John Locke and her understanding of rights, but, but she has, uh, she's sort of fighting with Rousseau in a lot of this and Rousseau's understanding of kind of the sexed soul, uh, the feminine and masculine soul. And she says, hold on a second, you know, the soul is unsexed and men and women are equal in dignity because they are rational creatures created by and responsible to God. Um, and so need to be afforded kind of the intellectual and moral formation they need. Uh, and this is why she's such an advocate for obviously for women's education. Um, but she's also a small R Republican. And um, of course, Price was as well. And so she's um, very interested in, in the way in which um, Republican forms of government would allow for the liberty to promote um, virtue. Um, and, and, and she wants to see that as well in marriage. And this is where we come to Abigail Adams, right? So she, um, of course, early on, um, you know, this is just before the declaration. It's amazing in those letters with her and John Adams, where she's challenging her husband um, on basically women's place in, in the new legal consolation. Um, and she draws this explicit parallel between the arbitrary political rule that the Declaration of Independence is repudiating, right? And the rule that husbands have over their wives. Um, of course, she's referring to coveture. And it's something that 
both she and Wollstonecraft got very clearly the same sort of moral logic governs the home and marriage that governs, you know, uh, sort of political rule. And that if someone has arbitrary rule um, over a subordinate, if there's that inequality, it's very hard for either party to actually exercise virtue and therefore find happiness. So I'll just then quote, you know, the famous, the famous lines of Abigail Adams. Um, she says, in the new codes of law, which I suppose will be necessary for you to make, I desire that you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited powers into the hands of their husbands. Again, just as a parenthetical, William Blackstone has articulated coverture just decades before. Um, and, and the common law, Blackstone, of course, was the most well-read of all, you know, the attorneys um, who are the founders read Blackstone. It all came in and so did coverture. So she says, remember all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment our rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. And so that just is sort of, you see Seneca Falls coming, you know, of course it's, it's still decades away, but the same sort of argument is the one that they make there at the beginning of Seneca, uh, the, the Declaration of, of um, Sentiments and Resolutions. Fascinating. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful uh, illumination of the connection between Wilson Craft and Abigail Adams, uh, the Richard Price connection, and their joint uh, deep rooting in the writings of the classics. Uh, Jack Rakoff, um, uh, John Locke, of course, was a one of many sources for Jefferson in the second treatise. He, he, in writing about the state of nature, he just finds it as a state of equality, wherein all the power and jurisdiction is reciprocal, no one having more than another. And then he says, this equality of men by nature, the judicious hooker looks upon as so evident in itself and beyond all question that he makes the foundation of that obligation to mutual love amongst men. Um, tell us more about Locke and the other natural law theorists, including Francis Hutcheson and, and Jean-Jacques Berlamacchi, um, and, and, and their notion of uh, the natural equality in the state of nature, uh, which Bill Allen said was extended to all human beings and not just citizens, and then how, how, how Jefferson channeled it and, and how he understood it as, as more of a, a collective right of, of nations uh, to, to, to be equal and how that evolved subsequently to a more individualistic conception of equality. Thanks, Jeff. I, actually, I think I'll leave it to Bill to, to bring in the other natural law theorists as he wishes, because as, as I read the Declaration of Independence, I see it first and foremost as a uh, political statement directed to solve a particular problem at the moment that the Continental Congress is about to make a decision. And so the, the, the line of influence that I would draw runs pretty directly from the overall, you know, from, from the, the great thrust of Locke's second treatise to the uh, immediate political purposes of the Declaration of Independence. You know, there's a guy, I always thought there's a kind of curious irony with Jefferson being stuck in Philadelphia drafting the Declaration. He actually wanted to go back to Williamsburg, uh, to his own college town. He wanted, um, he actually thought maybe Congress should suspend its deliberations so that uh, uh, its members could go back and, and join in drafting the first day constitutions, uh, which he, he mid-May mid 1776, he describes it's the whole object of the present controversy. Uh, it's actually to kind of perfect our notions of constitutional government. But, you know, the Virginia delegation was short on hands and Jefferson had to stay in Philadelphia. And so he's, he's stuck with the, uh, you know, the kind of the committee assignment that basically gives him his, his eternal fame as the author of the Declaration. So Jefferson's immediate task in, you know, in, in June 1776, you know, after the, you know, the debates that took place in kind of Congress and, you know, the, at, the, at the end of the first week is to, is to come up with a statement uh, justifying the American claim to independence. And the direct line you draw to lock there uh, is essentially the line that goes from on what basis can a people, that's to say a collective entity, who we will define somehow as, you know, as, as the American people or we the people eventually, uh, at, at what point and on what basis do they have the right to declare themselves a self-governing entity? Uh, that's Jefferson's immediate project. The idea of reaching the more fundamental questions of uh, civic equality or legal equality or individual equality or social equality, the issues, all the issues that have resonated in American history uh, from you know, the revolutionary period down into our own time, uh, those were not Jefferson's immediate concerns. 
and they were not the real subjects of debate uh, in the kind of Congress. So, so, you know, the whole the the, you know, the the whole point here was, you know, for the American people to, you know, ass assume the separate e and equal station among the nations of er the earth to which they're entitled by the laws of nature and of nature's God. Uh, and so that's, in a certain sense, I, you know, being trained as, you know, more as a political story than an intellectual story, I, I give a somewhat narrow, let's say, or somewhat, you know, cabin meaning uh, to the, you know, to how one should read to the Declaration in terms of the immediate intentions uh, of its, you know, of its framers and its adopters, uh, who included Bill, by the way, who did include James Wilson. Uh, as you know, as a mass correction here. But then I think what happens, you know, I think maybe not in the first minute, maybe not even in the 1770s, but I think you start to see it as early as the 1780s and certainly no later than 1790 uh, is that the reading of the declaration that has, that has dominated American political culture, or indeed our, our culture more generally, ever since starts to take hold pretty quickly. That's to say the common sense reading uh, of we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, et cetera. That, that the, it's just the, in certain sense, it's just the, that all men are created equal. It's reading that phrase and applying to it its most obvious meaning, uh, be, you know, became, I think, the, you know, the common sense, uh, or just one could just say the common, uh, became the common and the common sense interpretation of what Jefferson and his, and his, and his, and his declaration uh, had, had been up to. I think you start to see this, for example, in the debates about the anti, and, you know, probably come back to this later in conversation, but the anti-slavery debates that start taking place in Massachusetts in the 1780s, where, you know, in a certain sense, the idea of uh, emancipation is, uh, you know, applies a simple statement of equality principles found in the Massachusetts Constitution. You certainly find it in a set of debates I've been looking at uh, fairly closely in, in recent weeks, the, the 1790 debates in, uh, the, in the first federal Congress in, in its final session over the three anti-slavery petitions that come from, you know, the Quakers and, um, hmm. uh, you know, in Philadelphia, New York. I have to say I'm a haver for grad, so I have a Quaker link to, you know, my links to Philadelphia have, have a Quaker origin as well. And then also, of course, in, in the petition that comes from the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. Uh, when you, when you, you know, Congress spends some weeks with those documents. It, it, it actually, it, it, it takes a, I won't say a surprise long time, but it, you know, there's a very contentious debate over, um, uh, over those petitions. But, you know, when you get to that debate, you see that our, what becomes our common reading of the Declaration. It is about, an, it is about a form of individual equality. It's not just about the right of the Americans as a people to assume a separate and equal station among the nations of the earth because we've suffered a long train of abuses uh, from an arbitrary crown and an arbitrary parliament. And, you know, and we've given them, we've given them multiple chances to repent and to put us, it returns to the, in a sense to the status quo ante of 1763, they failed to do that. So now we are entitled to declare independence and, you know, you know, you know and, 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 and seek our separate and equal station. Uh, so Jeffrey, you know, Congress and Jefferson had one set of purposes, but by, you know, over the next decade, decade and a half, uh, the, the reading, uh, you know, the, of, of the declarations prevailed ever since became the norm. And we've been wrestling with its consequences uh, as, as a culture and as a people uh, for exactly that reason. Thank you so much for that. Uh, it's wonderful to have your Philadelphia connections and also your deep learning <laughs> about the uh, influence of those Quaker and other petitions, which show so powerfully, as you say, that uh, a shift from a, a more collective and political to an individualistic conception of equality and much looking forward to your, the, the work that that recent research is illuminating. Uh, Ellen DeBoise, you've, you've listened to this uh, debate about the intellectual and political sources of the Declaration. To what degree were the ideals of the Declaration uh, influential in the in the 19th century in helping to spark the women's suffrage movement and the movement for women's equality? Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, I can plunge right in here. Um, uh, to follow up on Erica, um, uh, the uh, uh, Lucretia Mott, of course, a Philadelphia Quaker was familiar uh, with uh, um, 19th century, I think she was born in the 1790s, uh, was familiar with Mary Wollstonecraft and um, <clears throat> instructed her young protege, Elizabeth Cady Stanton in these issues. And so Stanton, uh, when she came to, uh, to take the lead in the Seneca Falls Declaration, 
uh, was very much influenced by uh, Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, <clears throat> the Seneca Falls Declaration, it's not the Declaration of Independence, interestingly enough. It's called the Declaration of Sentiments, which is a term uh, borrowed from the uh, American Anti-Slavery Society. And even so, I'm not sure why they use the word sentiments, which is a term usually associated with uh, women and the emotions. Nonetheless, of course, the Declaration of Sen uh, Sentiments of 1848 begins, uh, the uh, prologue begins with a restatement of the Declaration of Independence uh, with two crucial changes. All men and women are equal, it says, and it replaces the tyranny of kings with uh, the tyranny of men over women. So it's a very radical document. Um, it, uh, suffrage is there uh, contentiously. It, it's uh, resisted by, uh, particularly uh, by Quakers and other radical abolitionists who think that politics is not a good way to go. But the thing I wanna emphasize is that the Declaration of Sentiments uh, includes a full range of criticisms of the subordination of uh, women to men, uh, including in culture and attitudes about uh, women's uh, nature uh, and uh, uh, economic equality, uh, equality of access to education and professions. Um, uh, as well as suffrage. And it takes really the Civil War period before suffrage rises uh, to become uh, the, uh, the lead uh, um, uh, form of uh, equality. Stanton is very much influenced for her whole life. Uh, her whole career focuses on uh, independence for women. Uh, this is, uh, she's, by the way, uh, uh, a wife of 50 years and a mother of seven. Uh, but um, she believes profoundly in the crucial nature of, uh, of the independence of the self. As she says uh, the, in her final and most moving uh, uh, expl uh, expiration, ex explanation of this, the, so the solitude of self, the individual nature of the self. Uh, just one more uh, comment, which is, uh, why have we had to leap all the way up to the 19th century? It's 1848. Um, uh, and um, the, there are many answers, but I would say the most interesting one to take us out of the just the American context is that, of course, 1848 is a year of revolutions about um, political equality throughout Europe. And because the United States is unique in its, uh, its uh, granting of political equality to all white men, um, uh, the, uh, the cutting edge issue of political equality, political equality is for women. And, and so <clears throat> the women's rights movement, um, which gives birth to the women's suffrage movement later, the women's rights movement is one could call the uh, American Revolution of 1848. Absolutely fascinating. What a what a wonderful connection between Wollstonecraft and uh, Caddy Stanton and Lucretia Mott. And thank you for helping us understand why it took until 1848 for these ideals to be embodied in the uh, uh, Declaration of Sentiments. All right, for this next round, I want um, very much to learn from all of you about uh, the degree to which these principles of equality and natural law and natural rights were and were not consistent with, with um, the reality of, of chattel slavery. Uh, Bill Allen, you've, you've written that James Wilson in his important lectures on natural law ruled out slavery as quote, unauthorized by the common law. Indeed, it is repugnant to the principles of natural law that such a state should subsist in any social system. Tell us more about whether and why Wilson and other founders thought that slavery was inconsistent with natural law. Did Jefferson share Wilson's views uh, when he talked about slavery uh, harming the passions of the slaveholders? And do you know, what, was, what on earth was his, how did he reconcile 
uh, the existence of chattel slavery with, with his soaring words in the Declaration, and, and how did the other natural law theorists on which they relied, including the classical and enlightenment authorities, deal with the question of, of slavery? Well, let's, let's begin, Jeffrey, by simply acknowledging that Jefferson recognized the error of slavery without reconciling it. It is not an uncommon thing in human life for people to hold contrary positions uh, morally and practically or to be unable to uh, cash in their moral sentiments in the face of their practical necessities. And, and that certainly defined Thomas Jefferson's situation. But, but let me say that it is also true that someone like James Wilson didn't have that problem. And it is not an accident that the move toward abolition began immediately in the aftermath of the Declaration of Independence. The fact that it didn't happen in one stroke of lightning is insignificant. The dynamic was, from the beginning, a move toward abolition. And we saw it move progressively from the North toward the South. It, of course, reached an impasse, an impasse that is politically explained, and nobody's better at doing that than Jack Rayco. But it is nevertheless the case that those principles were in unavoidable. They were there. They were moving. It was a dynamic process. The fact that we got to 1860 is not an accident. So we must say that in the era of the founding and of the Declaration, we saw established the pattern that would move straightforwardly through 1848 up to 1860. And, and I would want to interject that 1848, they use the word sentiments not necessarily as a, a stroke of momentary genius, but remember the whole Scottish Enlightenment was founded on the theory of moral sentiments. It was very different from the other Enlightenment traditions. Adam Smith wrote a book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And the, the principle uh, embedded in those 18th century principles was that it was not rational deliberation that produced the conviction of the necessary equality of human beings, but an intrinsic moral sentiment. And when in 1848 they re return to that or recur to that, they are embracing that broad principle which encompasses men and women, not distinguishing women from men. It was not because it was a feminine principle, in other words. The Scottish Enlightenment did not make it a feminine principle, but made it an alternative to mere rational deliberation. That was the key in 1848. And I would also want to say that, you know, when I said that Jefferson wasn't involved in the Declaration with respect to the meaning of the cause, I don't mean that he wasn't a signator. What I meant was he was not part of the, those who elaborated the meaning of what was expressed in the Declaration of Independence the way he did in the Constitutional Convention and thereafter. But it is the case, of course, that that committee that developed the Declaration of Independence was trying to accomplish an immediate political objective, but it is more precisely the case that they were trying to accomplish several political objectives. And that committee was very much controlled by Richard Henry Lee and John Adams. Thomas Jefferson was drafting under direction. Changes were made in that document that were extremely important in elucidating what these principles were. John Adams had antecedently developed the theory of the pursuit of happiness. It did not get there as a stroke of Jeffersonian genius. He did it in his thoughts concerning the revolution. He did it in his uh, proclamation he developed for the General Court of Massachusetts in January of 1776. So that in this broader picture, what we must focus on are the moving dynamics of the situation. People were being moved from day to day. It was not static. They were not positioned to say yay or nay to what they thought would be an indefinite future. They were positioned to try to leverage every opportunity they could in the direction of progressive understanding of the human situation in the world. And that's what really lies at the bottom of the Declaration of Independence. That's why equality is the key term that drives dynamically our whole social and political development, because that is an unsettled concept. It can only be settled through the dynamics of our social and political life even though it has a straightforward meaning in terms of natural law. So, so that I would say the way to get to your question and many of the observations that have been made can be gotten to in a straightforward manner through the observations that uh, uh, Erica had already introduced from Richard Price, who identified two principles as foremost. Most principles were, of course, the, the founding era itself, the commitment to equality. But he said, as she quoted, next to Christianity, which is a reminder of the argument in Montesquieu's spirit of the laws, 
that the greatest gift to humankind was Christianity, coupled with the argument he made in book 11, chapter six of the Spirit of the Laws, that every man, and he meant every human being, who is thought to have a free soul ought to be self-governing. Now, it, it, that's the yeast of revolution. That's where we find the yeast of revolution. And planning it in the political circumstances of the 18th century produced the leavening effect that we've been living with ever since. Wow, what a powerful metaphor of the leavening effect of the, <clears throat> of the yeast of, of, of Montesquieu's insight. Um, Erica Bakayoki, tell us more about the sources of Price's connection between moral and political self-government, the idea that no one who arbitrarily exercised authority over another in the domestic sphere could be free in the political sphere. Were there other thinkers in addition to Price, Bill, Bill just cited uh, Montesquieu who drew that uh, connection? And how did not only uh, women's uh, suffrage advocates like uh, Wilson Crafts and, and Adams uh, invoke those ideals, but also abolitionists invoke those ideals uh, to challenge the system of uh, child slavery? Yeah, I think it's really helpful to, I mean, this is, uh, you know, very much in a lot of Ellen's, Ellen's work on, on suffrage, but just to remind ourselves that those first, you know, women's um, advocates were very much abolitionists first, Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and they come out of that movement. And what's fascinating um, is, is a figure like Sarah Grimke, who was very much influenced by Mary Wollstonecraft, but in her 1838 um, book, uh, Letters on the Equality of the Sexes, she is able to do this uh, sort of fascinating um, thing where you know she she and her sister had come up from the south um, were very outspoken advocates uh, for abolition and had basically drawn kind of the fire or the ire of um, sort of more conservative Christian sects who basically said like women shouldn't be able to speak out against anything because they should remain meek and it's you know changing it, it, it distorts their character and all that so part of what Seneca Falls is doing is really, you know, as Ellen was saying, is like looking at sort of the social inequality that would keep women from speaking out, as they say, for all righteous causes. You know, they say in Seneca Falls that women have this right and responsibility to speak out. And they're talking about very much about, about slavery there. But the other thing that Sarah Grimke does is she does this kind of amazing in her letters on the equality of the sexes, this amazing exegesis of Genesis. And she looks at the original language because of course, Genesis and sort of the Adam and Eve story have been like, you know, the place kind of the grounding of um, women's subordination for sort of so long. And so she looks there, she looks at the original uh, language and she basically says there's been this perversion in the interpretation of Holy Writ. And she shows, she kind of makes this, this thoroughgoing case for the original quality of men and women in the Bible, which is, really fascinating. And I would, you know, send your, um, you know, those who are watching both to those letters, but also to her kind of amazing um, letter um, called marriage, which is, has all sorts of, we could talk for hours and hours about that. But I, I bring that up because of the influence she also had on Seneca Falls and the way you can find, as Bill's been talking about this natural law language shot through um, that document, um, both sort of drawing on Grimke's work and talking about sort of the intention of the creator. It says, you know, women as men's equal was intended to be so by the creator and the highest good of the race demands that she should be recognized as such. That's sort of the Grimke-esque, you know, the, the um, more sort of Unitarian or Christian view. But then there's this real natural law approach where they actually call upon Blackstone, which is, you know, sort of ironic given uh, that he brings us coveture too. But, um, you know, there's this line, um, there's this self-evident truth growing out of the divinely implanted principles of human nature, which they say is binding all over the globe in all countries and all times. They say that any laws which place women in a position inferior to that of man are contrary to the great precept of nature and therefore have no force or authority. I'm quoting here. And so, you know, there again, I'm gonna give you another quote because it's just all in there. It is time it says that she should move in the enlarged sphere which her creator, her great creator has assigned her. Um, and that, and then this is a real Wollstonecraftian language that the equality of human rights results necessarily from the fact of the identity of the race in capacities and responsibilities. 
And so once they have, you know, they're invested with, you know, these same capabilities and responsibilities, then it talks about them having the right and the duty equally with man to promote every, to promote every righteous cause by every righteous means and not be sort of silenced, you know, as, as these abolitionist women had been. They also speak, of course, up against the prevailing double standard, but they're asking men to kind of join women at a high level of, of, of you know, uh, virtue. They say the same amount of virtue, delicacy, and refinement of behavior expected of women should be expected of men. And then they talk about, you know, equal participation with men in various trades, professions, commerce, and finally that sacred right to the elective franchise, which as Ellen mentioned was unpopular, but then comes to be with in due course. But it's this fascinating merger of natural law and this sort of Sarah Grimke-esque uh, vision of, of the equality of the sexes very much in the Bible that is, that is um, grounding equality there at Seneca Falls. Fascinating. Thanks so much for the quotations and for the, and we'll put them in the chat and I know that our uh, viewers will want to follow up on uh, on all of them. Um, Jack Rakoff, as Bill Allen says, you've done so much to uh, illuminate our understanding of the degree to which the effort by abolitionists to invoke the ideals of the De Declaration was thwarted in the, in the years uh, leading up to the Civil War and, and how it eventually took a war to enshrine them in the Constitution. Can you tell us more about the inconsistencies? I mean, wh wh where should listeners look to, to see Jefferson tie himself in knots trying to reconcile slavery with natural law and the declaration? And then in addition to the political struggles, tell us about the, uh, the, the, the ideological evolution uh, from 1776 to the Civil War uh, that ultimately led the ideals of the Declaration to be enshrined in the Fourteenth Amendment. Uh, Jeff, uh, uh, how many hours do I? Have? <laughs> I know I'm asking a lot, and you're all doing an amazing job at distilling all this. Yeah, look, I, yeah, there, you know, there's so many ways to approach this. So let me uh, let me offer, I think, uh, two points of departure. First is, a, is, is in a sense, um, a bit historiographical. You know, one of my colleagues at Stanford. Uh, well, I should say one of my late colleagues was Don Fehrenbacher, you know, who did, you know, the great book on Dred Scott. And uh, early on in the you know, Pulitzer Prize winning book, and early in the book, Don uh, had this kind of sim simple formula, which, which I relied on my own work, which is to, which is to distinguish anti-slavery sentiment from pro-slavery interest. And the idea here was the interest, you know, represented by, you know, the slaveocracy or the slaveholding South was hard, defensive, aggressive, militant. The sentiment was in a sense more diffuse. It was a sentiment and it didn't quite, ha it didn't quite have the same driving force in motivating power. And it was somewhat confused as to what its objectives were. I mean, if you trace the history of anti-slavery, uh, you know, from let's say the, you know, the, the mid 18th century, or you know, let's say the final third or so of the 18th century on into the 19th century, what were its objectives? Were, was it, you know, I, I would tend to argue that its first objective is, is, is to limit and end the slave trade. Uh, abolitionism per se, uh, in, you know, in, in certainly in the sense in which we associate with, with someone like William Lloyd Garrison after the you know, late 1820s, 1830s, uh, was an option that made even many, many advocates of anti-slavery uh, nervous and diffident. Um, many many uh, advocates of anti-slavery preferred the ideas of diffusion. You're going to kind of diff if Jefferson Madison fit this. You diffuse the the slave population across the landscape, and maybe that would turn slavery into a more modern institution. Or, of course, it's coupled with colonization. Uh, the idea that uh, emancipated uh, slaves, once freed, have to be sent somewhere else, and where that somewhere else was would be back to Africa. In the Sierra Leone or eventually Liberian example, or would it be somewhere you know way out west or you know below the, the Rio Grande. And I think this ties into the dilemma that Jefferson finds himself in. I mean, you know, Jefferson wrestles with this, in, uh, uh, particularly in you know the famous Query 14 and notes on the state of Virginia, where he has what is to us this horribly offensive passage, which is a kind of it's a kind of progenitor, it's a prototype of what would become the much more militant and aggressive racism that we associate with 19th century American thinking, much more than I think was the case in the 17th or 18th century. The idea that blacks are by definition an inferior species and, and you know, inferior race. 
uh, that you know that, that you know who you know who are who are properly you know consigned to a condition of slavery. I mean, Jefferson, it seems to me, was wrestling with the problem that we're still that we're still wrestling with today. How do you create a a a, a bi or a multiracial society? Uh, it's easy to condemn Jefferson for being the hypocrite that he was and for failing to work out these contradictions. But I think if, you know, as, as I've always tried to explain to my students here, if you try to deal with the problem that he's trying to conf uh, confront, not very successfully from our vantage point. In fact, really, it winds up being a dismal failure. But because it's a problem we're wrestling with still, I'm, I'm inclined to cut him some slack. So Jefferson's trying to imagine uh, if, it, you know, if, 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 if the slave population were liberated, you know, under a general scheme of, you know, the kind of, you know, kind of gradual emancipation scheme to which he was, you know, moderately attracted. Uh, what would happen then? If, if you go back to the famous Query 14 in the notes on the state of Virginia, which I think is a seminal text that we all have to read and wrestle with. Uh, on the one hand, Jefferson says, look, uh, race relations are already so sour uh, between whites and blacks. I mean, white, whites, wh you know, whites live in an atmosphere of fear and, you know, blacks have and even a number of reasons you know, to seek a justice they've been denied over generations. Uh, Jefferson's first position is to say that, you know, it's very doubtful that these two peoples could ever live peacefully together. Uh, I think had he stopped there, you know, we'd be happier with Jefferson. Now, we wouldn't be happy with the result, but, you know, we'd say this is just, you know, he's, he's being kind of a realist here. Uh, and of course, Jefferson goes on, he goes into this fumbling exercise to talk about, can we actually talk in some quasi-objective sense or you know, quasi quote unquote scientific sense about the differences between the races and makes a complete and utter mess of it and then says at the very end of that passage, but I have to say, we haven't really studied these differences seriously you know, in, in the end. So I, I, I think the problem here is if you try to write the history of anti-slavery the way historians like to do it, we tend to be fussy about dates and phases and um, you know, the limit, you know, the limitations as well as the opportunities. So on the one hand, out of a combination of religious and political motives, anti-slavery sentiment in, in the sense in which, you know, my colleague Don Fehrenbacher used that term and yeah, we can run it back to Adam Smith uh, and, you know, ask, you know, ask all of it's uh, is certainly growing and developing in the context of and in the aftermath of the revolution. On the other hand, it confronts an interest you know, which is, and you see this in the 1790 debate, and you see it thereafter, which is, it's hard, it's militant, it's aggressive, it's perfectly comfortable saying, no, no, there's lots of, you know, the Bible is perfectly, you know, happy with slavery. Uh, you know, if, if you want to take a, you know, religious view of things, uh, you, we, can, we can pull out any of a number of, you know, texts and chapters and passages, uh, you know, from, you know, from the Old and New Testament alike, uh, which seem, you know, wholly conducive to, wholly conducive to slavery. So I think that's the you know, that's the kind of you know being a historian. I'm all in favor of messiness, uh, and that's the kind of you know that's in a sense the messy situation that you know, with which we have to do. Thanks for that uh, eloquent uh, argument in favor of uh, messiness and and complexity, and for calling our attention to Query 14 on the notes of the State of Virginia, which we'll also put in the chat as we are all of these great uh, homework assignments. Uh, Barbara Baruch asked, people always quote Abigail Adams' quote, but never John's response. Was there any response by John? I just happened to have John. Can I, um, response. Oh, can I uh, enter this question about abolition and slavery, please? Absolutely. I'll just read uh, John Adams' response if I, uh, although I may have just lost it on my screen, but essentially he was, he gave a flip response. Here it is, uh, saying... As to your extraordinary code of laws, I cannot but laugh, he responded. We've been told that our struggle has loosened the bands of government everywhere, that children and apprentices were disobedient. We know better than to repeal our masculine system. Abigail was so distressed that she wrote to her friend, Mercy Otis Warren, recounted the exchange and noted sarcastically about John. So I've helped the sex abundantly, but I'll tell him I've been only making a trial of the disinterestedness of his virtue. And when weighed in the balance, have found it wanting. Um, it would be wonderful, uh, Ellen Du Bois, if, if you could indeed uh, give, give us a sense of, of precisely that question, and then take us, I know we're having very broad strokes here, you left us in 1848, take, take us up to the adoption of the 19th Amendment and the degree to which uh, uh -huh. notions of uh, equality embodied in the declarations of sentiments were invoked and also evolved uh, in the fight for the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Well, I'd actually like to speak a little bit about the question of slavery and abolition because it's so central to the legacy of the women's suffrage movement. 
Um, I've just been uh, reading about the World's Anti-Slavery Convention of 1840, um, which is a famous part of uh, the beginning of women's rights in the United States. And uh, when the British uh, anti-slave, British abolitionists refused to seat women, American women, they keep on talking about women's rights as an abstract question. And it is the, that shouldn't be brought to interfere with abolition. And uh, it is that repeated sense that uh, the equality of women uh, does not have the weighty nature of, uh, of, and of abolition that continues to haunt the relationship between the two movements. Um, the, uh, just to jump way ahead, um, the, uh, uh, the um, uh, centennial of the 19th Amendment has coincided with Black Lives Matter and has brought up a lot of attention to claims of racism in the suffrage movement. And let me just say that um, we've been spending a lot of time in the uh, late 18th century, but the women's suffrage movement covers a quarter of American history and its growth takes place in the late 19th and early 20th century when the United States itself is plunged into a reactionary response to uh, reconstruction and black suffrage. Um, and so the suffrage movement is um, uh, accused uh, with, of, of, of excluding black women. This is a very complex question, but I would just say that to the degree that it becomes a white dominated movement, it is completely consistent with everything else going on in the United States. I mean, Women's, uh, the 19th Amendment takes place uh, in the high years of Jim Crow um, and uh, is very much affected by that. And I would just add one other thing, which is uh, black women remain very dedicated to the issue of uh, gender equality uh, in, in general and uh, political equality in particular. And really to jump even further ahead, um, black women have consistently registered at a higher level of agreement with various feminist issues from the ERA to abortion than white women. Thank you for that crucially important uh, history and for reminding us of that connection. Um, the, ch the chat is just uh, full of appreciation to all of you for your learning. People are asking for a uh, uh, reconvening uh, uh, part two, which I, I would be honored to host. But uh, for, I think we have time for one last uh, intervention by each of you. And I'll, 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 I'll leave it to each of you to focus on the topics you think are most relevant. But our friend uh, Colin Thibault says, wants some notion of the topic we promised to talk about, which is not only what is the historic meaning of equality, but what can it teach us today? And, and Bill Allen, in your piece about James Wilson and the original meaning of the declaration, you also cited King as the 20th century uh, channel or prophet of, the, of that vision. So, so in what ways did, did King channel uh, natural law theory and, and what can his vision of equality teach us today? Well, uh, certainly one goes immediately to the letter from Birmingham jail for speaking of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, where he goes at great length both to develop from the original or antecedent classical natural law theory up to the modern day application of those principles. So you get a comprehensive statement from King that it, as it were traverses the whole messiness, and I love that word Jack Rico, the whole messiness. Because one of the things we discover is when we try to paint in broad categories, we always miss the realities. Precisely because everything is so messy whether it's women's suffrage in the presence of Jim Crow, whether it's abolitionism in the presence of the women's rights movement in Seneca Falls. You know, I've written a great letter on Harriet Beecher Stowe, as you know, and I will observe that she not only was a major focus in abolitionism, but she was a major focus in commenting on the status of women. Her output is not just Uncle Tom's Cabin. There's a long list of writings of extraordinary significance, including Old Town folks, where she tackles the Rousseauian sexing problem with great understanding. So, so that messiness is what characterizes the day throughout our looking at this. Thomas Jefferson had a second chance after Query 14 
which we remember he closes by saying, if God is just, we are in trouble. And so, so, so he recognizes in that statement the era of slavery. But then he gets a second chance when Benjamin Banneker comes to him in 1791 and says, now is the time to live up to your promises. And Jefferson fails again. So, so I won't cut him as much slack as Jack does, but I will say Jack is right. It's messy. It's all messy. But through the mess, we see a light shining. As Abraham Lincoln said in the debates with Stephen A. Douglas, the problem with you, Stephen, and the problem with the approach you're taking is you're blowing out the moral lights among us. He wanted to keep the moral light even in the midst of all the messiness. And that's what I bring to you in terms of our contemporary understanding. The light still shines, no matter how messy it is. We can still work through this, why? Because the fundamental principle is we are capable, that we've got this, we can do this. That is so moving. Through the mess, we see the light shining. We can indeed do this. And by learning from history, we can be inspired to live up to its best ideals. Ayaka Bakayoki, what would you like to leave our we, our, 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 our National Constitution Center friends with about what the, the, the meaningful history you've studied from Wilson Craft to Adams to the 19th century can teach us about our debates today. Well, I wanna uh, put forward the idea that um, perhaps, you know, the sort of quest for the equality between men and women is even messier than um, the quest for racial equality. And that, you know, would be for, I think, pretty obvious reasons. Um, and that is that, you know, it's, I think, pretty easy to say that, um, you know, uh, all, you know, people, regardless of their race, ethnicity, color, et cetera, are equal by virtue of being human. And we can say the same of men and women, but there's this small problem, <laughs> which ends up being a big problem. And that is um, that there's, you know, reproduction is very asymmetrical. And so, you know, men and women engage in the same sexual act, but it is women who, of course, um, you know, both are privileged and burdened by um, those asymmetrical consequences, obviously regarding pregnancy, childbirth, and all that. And so when you go up through the history of women's rights, you see responses to that asymmetry. And so if we were to continue on with a part two, we'd have to look at how, um, you know, in the book I've just written, uh, The Rights of Women, I show sort of this sort of Wollstonecraftian strain, which kind of takes seriously these asymmetries and tries to respond to them. And then more of a, a million, uh, a, a strain following John Stuart Mill, which tends to be more a strict equality, which also I would say carries with Elizabeth Cady Stanton would be in that line. And there's this kind of battle <laughs> between these two strands. Um, and it starts really, I mean, at the very beginning with questions about joint property and separate property ownership, but then go goes right through kind of articulations of why women should have suffrage. Um, so you can see Alice Paul versus like a Francis Willard. Um, and then it goes right up through sort of the progressive era and looking at, you know, responses to industrialization, you know, protective worker, you know, women's legislation or, um, or you know, then comes sort of the ERA and all of that history of the ERA um, running up through, I mean, our time is very much sort of this question of how do you deal with these asymmetries between men and women when it comes to reproduction. The, the easy things were answered, I think, um, by Polly Murray, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, anti-discrimination law, where we could kind of get like, of course, men and women, there shouldn't be dis, you know, uh, sort of um, sex-based laws when it comes to sort of when there are no reproduction or biological differences. But when it comes to those differences, how do we respond? And I think those questions are much, much more difficult and messier um, when it comes to questions of, of women and men um, and their equality. Thank you very much for that. Thank you for your thoughts on the ERA and several of our friends have asked about the ERA and we're chatting our recent programs on the ERA, which are relevant to this question. Jack Rakoff, what can the important history we've been discussing about uh, equality in the Declaration teach us about our debates today? Uh, I want to note that I'm wearing my tie, which has all the signatories of the Declaration and Thomas, from Monticello, Thomas Jefferson at the bottom. You know, I, Jeff, I don't know if I have a big answer, but I have, you know, I, I, I do have a couple of reflections that I think go back to the, the Jefferson Locke. Uh, connection, uh, particularly Locke's letter concerning toleration uh, and Jefferson's plan for legislative reform, you know, the revision of the laws of Virginia 
which is which which was his great enterprise. You know, part of Jefferson's program uh, was to take Virginia's what they called the wastelands, meaning the unappropriated lands, and to divide them up among uh, would-be Republican households. You know, male and female. God created them both, husband and wife, uh, and to give both spouses. Uh, a claim on Virginia's lands, and the you know the theory the theory of this was to um, you know in effect was was to create self sufficient Republican households, with an adequate material basis to you know fulfill the idea of the of the of the, of the you know the Jeffersonian farmer, except it would be the household itself and not just the male uh, you know the dominant male figure within it. Uh, Jefferson's scheme of public education. Uh, which is, you know, for you know, the mass of Virgi free Virginians would only be three years, but three years in the 18th century would be a lot of education. Uh, and, you know, envisioned educating boys and girls alike without, dis without discriminating between them. Uh, I also think that Jefferson's approach to religious liberty, and, uh, you know, which I think uh, draws a lot of inspiration from Locke, although as Jefferson said, where Locke stopped, we can go further. You know, Locke, you know, Locke in his, you know, in the letter concerning toleration had discussed, uh, you know, who is, you know, who is the more, who is the more authoritative parent, you know, the, you know, the mother or the father, uh, and actually had some fairly enlightened, uh, you know, I, 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 ideas on that point. So I happen to think if, if, if I had one big takeaway, particularly, you know, in this period when we're agonizing so much about American history, where we're going to start in, so I'm sure you're attuned to this already, where Revolution 250 and how we think about independence is, is, is going to have a massive impact on, on our culture. I remain a big fan of Jefferson, you know, with all his faults, with all his shortcomings, with all his contradictions, with his desire to, to, you know, to make the rebuilding of Monticello, his great private project, uh, you know, with his, you know, uh, you know, terrible indifference to what would happen with slaves when his estate had to wrestle with his debts. I don't see how Americans can think about equality without wrestling with Jefferson uh, in every sense of the term. That means wrestling with his shortcomings as well as his promises. That's, you know, that's part of the challenge of doing history, which is, as Bill rightly picked up on, is necessarily a messy subject. You cannot think about equality without thinking about and wrestling with Jefferson. Thank you for that powerful challenge. Uh, Ellen DuBois, the last word in this wonderful discussion is to you, what lessons can the history we've been discussing teach about our debates today? Uh, thank you. Getting the last word, what a treat. Um, I want to pick up on um, something that both I and Erica said. Uh, I, I want to really emphasize very strongly that um, there is still a tendency to regard women's rights as either a derivative or a side issue, rather than something that opens up um, aspects of equality uh, that otherwise do not exist. So it's not merely a matter of extending equality for men to women, but to consider how equality for women changes our understanding of equality. Um, because time is short, I'll just speak about the contemporary, about uh, the contemporary issue of women's equality uh, deriving from the ERA, but more generally, uh, if we look at the current political environment, it becomes completely clear that the issue of abortion is not a side issue or something particular to a, a group of people, but opens up the whole question of equality in personal rights and personal life. We know, uh, uh, and, and Erica raises this when she talks about reproduction, nothing about the original conception of equality gets to the level of what happens to our bodies. And uh, we can be, just to end with a sort of negative prediction, uh, I think we can be pretty sure that if and when uh, abortion falls, uh, gay rights will fall after that. And uh, who knows what other aspects of the personal equality. And this was something that was central to Stanton. Uh, in some ways more basic than her belief in uh, political equality was her belief in the equality of the person and of the self. And that is what women's rights brings to this discussion. Thank you so much.
Bill Allen, Erica Bakayoki, Jack Rakoff, and Ellen Carol Du Bois for an extraordinarily provocative, deep, and illuminating discussion of the meaning of equality in America. I vote for a part two as well. We've already identified many issues that uh, the Supreme Court and American society will be confronting um, in, or in the new year. And it would be an honor to bring you back together to teach us about what history can uh, tell us about them. And thanks to you, friends, for taking an hour in the middle of your day to learn and grow in wisdom and to engage deeply with history. And as always, please follow up on the great homework that we've been chatting and read the primary sources yourself so that you can make up your own minds and read the great books of our brilliant panelists. Uh, once more, uh, William Allen, Erica Bakayoki, Jack Rakoff, and Ellen Carol Du Bois. Thank you for a wonderful program and happy Bill of Rights Day and happy new year and happy holiday.